This little fourth grader is trying to do her homework, but it's really hard to see, let alone learn, when there's only a candle and the wind keeps catching the flame. I work here. On the right, you see Puerto Rico. In the middle is the Dominican Republic, and this is Haiti. Other than the glow of the capital, it's hard to see the land from the sea, but there are seven million people living there in that darkness. Around the world, a billion people rely on flames for lighting. Two billion people are cooking with fuels like wood, charcoal, and dung. Being in a room with a kerosene lamp is the equivalent of smoking 40 cigarettes a day. And cooking over a smoky flame is even worse. Of course, women are most affected by this. And the soot from that smoke is a powerful climate warmer, hundreds of times more powerful than carbon dioxide. There are solutions to these problems. We turned on Haiti's first solar microgrid in 2015. It delivers 24-hour, reliable, affordable electricity to 2,000 people in a rural town. Some people claim that we need fossil fuels to solve energy poverty. But in our first year of operations, our grid was over 98% solar powered. It was either directly from the sun or from the sun stored in batteries for use at night. The other 1.5% was from a diesel generator, but that was the expensive and big hassle part. So we're working on phasing that part out. Behind these statistics, of course, there are stories. This mother is holding up her son to turn on electric light in their home for the first time. Imagine that. And when we turned on that grid, it created local jobs. It cleaned up the air. And it saved families and businesses a lot of money. In 2015, The Economist magazine sent a film crew to this town of Les Anglais to highlight the solar pioneers. They were solving energy access with solar energy. In 2016, Les Anglais was again in the international press. It was the town where Hurricane Matthew made landfall in Haiti as a Category 4 storm. A year and a half into our operations, we were hit with a 50-year storm. The happy highlight is that all of our team and all of our customers lived. Microgrids are supposed to be resilient energy infrastructure. And technically, they are. But what we learned from Matthew is that Resilient energy systems are only as resilient as the business systems behind them. Our physical system actually fared pretty well, but it took me over a year to raise the financing to build that grid back. We did. It's serving the town again, powered up. And we're about to turn on our second grid just down the coast. We're also working on our next 22 grids over the next three years. At this scale, we'll be able to have the insurance packages and the business systems that will enable us to better weather those storms. When electricity arrives in a town for the first time, it's a pivotal moment, and a lot can change. This is Roseanne. She's the grid ambassador in Les Anglais. That means she's the face of electricity for her town. She's also the first level of customer service. When we turned on the grid in Les Anglais, we got a customer call to the hotline. A man couldn't turn on his lights. I was in town, and I got to go with Roseanne on her first customer service call. She got there, she greeted the man, she assessed the situation, and she pulled on the string attached to the light. Light flooded the room. The man hadn't been pulling on the string hard enough. It was a simple case, but to that man, it was like, wow, this woman just invented electricity. <laughs> It was great, and I like to think that two things happened in that home right then. One, that man got electricity for the first time. And two, he saw a woman from his community in a completely new light. 
This is part of what I like to call feminist electrification. <laughs> Men and women are equal participants in this power system. Feminist electrification also means women can grow their businesses with electric machinery. It's also the electrification of cooking. Remember the health and climate impacts of that smoky cooking that we saw before? Not here, and we're just getting started. Of course, how we get and use electricity is not a Haitian problem. It's a human problem. I face a lot of obstacles in building microgrids in rural Haiti, but I have the easy job. People in Haiti are anxious to change the status quo because the status quo is darkness. Here in the States, things are different. But in Haiti, just like here, we are on the cusp of an energy transition of great consequence and a lot of importance. To solve climate change, we're going to, stop, we're going to have to stop burning gas and burning oil. We're going to have to plug things in, everything. That's a big ask, and it can feel quite personal. Speaking of disrupting the status quo, I had to convince my husband here in DC to change out our gas cooktop. It was not easy. He really likes cooking with fire. And I get it, fire's cool. But the more I learned about natural gas, the more I knew that we needed to get off of it. And the more we learned about induction cooking, the more we started to think, this is just a better technology. And so Sweet Stephen finally came around. And in a true act of love, he led the charge in swapping out our stove. We love it, and we're now officially an all-electric home. For heating and air conditioning, we have these boxes on our walls. We don't have any radiators or any vents. Uh, living in an all-electric home is convenient and super comfortable. We kind of can't imagine going back to the old way. We're all electric, but we're also spending less on electricity than the average home here, my utility bell tells me. And of course we can do this because we did a renovation and we really prioritized efficiency and insulation. It's not possible to electrify everything overnight, but if you see the future as electric, you can start to plan for it. It was only 140 years ago when Thomas Edison turned on his first microgrid in Manhattan. Back then, it was revolutionary to deliver electricity to homes and businesses. People were switching from gas lighting to newfangled electric light bulbs. Now, electricity's come a long way since then, but the job's not done yet. As we electrify everything, we're gonna need to move towards renewable energy. And although renewable energy is the fastest growing kind of electricity, we're really far away from getting of all of our energy from clean sources. Do you guys know where we are right now? Here in DC, we're at 5%. In the country, we're at 17%. In the world, 25. None of these numbers are close to 100, guys. <laughs> Last year, global carbon emissions rose by two and a half percent. We're moving in the wrong direction. But if we go to 100, we're gonna have to first get to more than half. And as we move towards more than half, it's something that each of us can do right now. Now, Four states in the District of Columbia and Puerto Rico have all passed resolutions saying that they will get to 100% renewables sometime between 2030 and 2050. Now that is charting the right direction, but it is a really long time from now, and it is not everywhere. I think we could all be getting, most of us in this room could be getting more than half of our electricity from clean energy sources. Is anybody doing this yet? Does anybody have solar in this room? Or are you part of a clean energy program? Yeah, it's hard to see. 
Well, great. I like to think that people getting more than half of their electricity from renewable sources are part of a club. And it's a really cool and diverse club. Who's in it? Well, you guys with your hands up, and me too. I went on the internet, I did some research, and I clicked on this button, and now I switched from my utility standard offering, 5% renewable, to 100% renewable energy. It is through my utility, it's through my same bill, it was super simple, and now it's automatic and easy. Latoya here in DC bought her home, got solar on her roof at no cost, then she bought an electric car and is teaching her kids how electricity works in a very real way. These farmers in Maryland realized it would be a good investment to go solar, so they did, and they love it. There are a lot of ways to get to more than half, and you have to do a little bit of research, but there are a lot of people who are anxious to help. In Haiti, just like here, clean local energy means local jobs, cleaner air, and lower bills. Of course, policy matters. In DC, there's a new program where low-income families can cut their electricity bills in half with efficiency and with local solar. Now, if this city can do it, others can too. We have air pollution days where my app tells me to not take my baby outside. That's disgusting. We're downwind from the Midwest coal plants. We have a lot of cars that burn gas. It doesn't have to be this way. When we zoom out, this more than half club looks even more interesting. It's global and super diverse. The thing about it is, though, that none of it really matters unless most of us join. My actions need your actions to matter. If this isn't the beginning of a movement to fundamentally change our energy systems, well, then Stephen just swapped out that stove for nothing, and we're all doomed. <laughs> but if we do come together, we can shift our energy, not only to solve the climate crisis, but also to address our other biggest challenges, health, opportunity, growth, security. When we participate in our power systems, we can change them. That's switching to renewable energy. It's also making sure our leaders are with us on this. We can do this. So what do you say? Are you in? <laughs> Join us. Thank you very much.